All right, let's jump right on in. I'm going to uh, starting this week. Uh, we're going to do. I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach. Um, I have actually, since we have started this little fellowship, I have yet to do one of these. And so we're going to do a book study. We're going to study the book of Ephesians. And um, anyway, as we get further into the study uh, over time, y'all are going to see more and more why I chose Ephesians. Um, it's power packed. I mean, every book of the Bible is obviously, but but for us under the dispensation of the grace of God, this is one that is just chock full of stuff right from the very first word, as y'all are going to see today. So let's start reading Ephesians chapter one, and we're gonna we're gonna start with two verses here. Verse one, and he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus. And to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, now here's the thing. Before we get into the particulars here, and boy, let me tell you, we're about to really dig in deep and kind of sink our heels in. But anytime you do a study of the book of the Bible... It's a really good idea to try to do what you can to collect all the information that you can and sort of get all these pieces. And as you see them connect, you kind of see the bigger picture here. And I want to try to start to do that this morning. Help us get a good understanding of, of the big picture here. And right off the bat, we get some big information right here in these first two verses. It, it seems very uneventful. These, these verses, when you read them, they sound just kind of standard issue. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, <laughs> to the Ephesians and the saints there and all stuff. I mean, it sounds really just kind of bland. But let me tell you, there's a lot in these two verses, as you're going to see today. And so we're going to dive in. And so um, the first couple things that we, we discover here is who wrote this letter and to whom it's written to. Okay, And those are very crucial pieces of information when it comes to not only the study of this book, but as you're going to see really in the study of our entire Bible. And so we're going to look at that. Now, he says there from the start, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Now, in first century writings, here's what would happen when, uh, when people would write letters to one another. They didn't do it like you and I do it today. If, if I were to write a letter, let's say I was going to write a love note to my wife and I was going to send it in the mail, I would start off by maybe saying, Dearest Claire, or whatever nickname I want to use, you know, to make it a little more personal. It's Valentine's Day. I've got to be all sweet and mushy, right? And, and then I would go about the body of the text and I'd write. And then at the end, I would have my salutation. And I wouldn't just say, Sincerely, Greg. Not on a love letter, right? I mean, I would I'd kind of ham it up. Love always. Or love with tenderness or something like that. And then I would sign my name. And see, that's how we write letters today. But back in the first century, when people would write letters, they would start off by identifying themselves. Hey, this is me that's writing you. And there would be some establishing information so that you know when you get the letter, it's not just from some fake. By the way, one of the things that apparently was going on early in the first century when Paul was out ministering and on his missionary journeys, after he would leave a place, there would be false teachers and these false prophets that would come in and they would try to upset the faith and the doctrine that Paul had established in these young churches. And one of the ways that they would do this is they would write false letters and so it was important in the first century for Paul, for these apostles, when they would write to these churches and these groups of people to really establish who they are. Now in this letter, we know that the author of this book, the book of Ephesians, is who? Paul. Okay? And so we're going to dig into who Paul is here in just a minute. Now, um, as we know and as we're going to continue to see, this apostle who wrote the letter was, was given the name Paul. Okay, And y'all remember this, if you go back in your study of the book of Acts, Paul, when he came into this earth, his name was what? Saul. Okay. Now, the, the name Paul, by the way, which was given to him by the Lord, okay, is, a, is a name that means little or small. Okay. Now, I don't think this was God teasing on Paul as a wee little man. I, I don't, and I'm, I don't even know if he was small in stature. I really don't know. However, this is the name given to him, and, and we're going to see why here in just a little bit, why that's a significant name. But he was born with the name Saul, which was in, in Hebrew means desired. Okay, And so it's significant that Saul went from being desired to being little. 
Now, when you and I think of the Apostle Paul, we don't think so little, do we? We think grand, we think big thoughts because he's the Apostle of the Gentiles. He's the Apostle to whom God has dictated that we are to pay attention to and follow, right? And so before we can get to know this Paul character that wrote the book of Ephesians and what will help us get further into the meat of this book is to understand this author, this guy named Paul who first was the, was the man named Saul, okay? And so we're going to do that. We're going to learn about uh, this character Saul, and we're going to get a pretty big lesson in the process. So y'all turn back with me. Keep your marker there on Ephesians chapter 1, and go back to the book of Acts. And we'll, we'll drop in first at Acts chapter 9 here in just a second. Acts chapter 9. Now, the first time we encounter this character Saul is in the book of Acts. But before we get to the first mention of this guy named Saul, I want to sort of skip around in the book of Acts a little bit because there are details about this guy that are scattered out throughout the book that I think will help us sort of put the picture together of who he was. And so we're going to do that. Now, the first thing that we learned is where he was born, and that's significant because the place he was born, just like where you and I, when you're born and raised in a place... It, it sort of informs your character. It, it, it molds who you are in a lot of ways. So, for example, um, I was born and raised in central Mississippi. And I can tell you the mindset of central Mississippians is even different than northwest Alabamians. I promise you that. Okay? I'll just go ahead and admit it. We're a lot more prejudiced. We just are. Y'all can judge me or be critical of that. I'm just kind of letting you know. It, it, it informs. I can tell you this too. Our education system was terrible. That's why I'm dumb. I'm blaming it on Mississippi. If I had born, been born in northwest Alabama, I mean, I'd be, I'd be on top of the heap, right? <laughs> and so, I mean, it's just different. But where we're born is different. If we were born, for example... Uh, in the state of California, in the city of San Francisco, do you think we would have a different lifestyle and a different mindset than being raised here in the South? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> okay? And so it just, it informs. So one of the first things we find is, is, is where Saul was born. Now look with me in Acts chapter 9. Come down to verse 10. And in Acts chapter 9, we get the story of, of Saul's conversion. And God shows up to this man named Ananias, a prophet, and he says, Hey, you're about to get a visitor, Ananias. Now come to verse uh, 10. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I'm here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul. This is our author of the Ephesians. Saul, and where is he from? Of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. Go with me to Acts chapter 21. I'm going to get a little bit more information. Acts chapter 21. And come all the way down to verse 39. And when you get over to Acts chapter 21, just to give you a little context here, Paul is on trial in Jerusalem. He was warned not to go there, but he went there anyway. And all these elites caught up with him and they imprisoned him. And then they were going to put him on trial and he's going to give his defense before the, these public officials. And in verse 39, Paul says, or Saul says of himself, verse 39, he says, um, But Paul said, I am a man which am a what? A Jew of Tarsus, a city where? In Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. And I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. So what we find out is this guy who was a Jew named Saul. He's from a place named Tarsus, which is in a region known as Cilicia. Now let me just kind of cut to the chase here. If you were to look at a world map right now, and you were going to kind of go over there and find the Mediterranean Sea... The Mediterranean Sea. You got Israel down here in sort of the bottom right corner. Okay? If you follow that coastline up and right as you turn the corner up here in the northeastern corner of the Mediterranean Ocean, you have the region of Cilicia. And Tarsus is right there on the coastline of Cilicia. And that's where the Apostle Paul is from. Now go with me to chapter 22, verse 3. Chapter 22, verse 3, and Paul says, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet 
I was brought up in this city where he is at that point is Jerusalem. I was brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers and was zealous toward God as ye all are this day. Okay, so here's a little information from us. Again, Tarsus by the way, and he says back there in chapter 21, verse 39, was no mean city. Here's what that means. It doesn't mean that everybody in the city of Tarsus was really nice. That's not what he's getting at. The word mean means unmarked. So when Paul says he was from Tarsus, which was a city that was not unmarked, that means it was a marked city. It means it was a well-known city. It was one where a lot of people traveled through, by the way, because of where its location was. There were a lot of trade routes going through and all this kind of stuff. Okay. Now here's another important fact about the city of Tarsus where Paul was born and lived for a little while before he moved to Jerusalem to be raised under the tutelage of Gamaliel. Tarsus was also... A uh, a navy city. They had a naval port there, and there was a river that ran through, and it was it was a prominent place for the navy, the warships, and things in that day. And as a result, too, it was a place of high culture and education. Okay. Now that's Saul's upbringing. He's kind of if you want to think about Tarsus, think about it like Annapolis, Maryland. In Annapolis, Maryland, the city is on the Chesapeake Bay, so you got the ocean, you got the naval, the U.S. Naval Academy there. You got a lot of culture, you got a lot of elites coming in there, a lot of education is very important there, and it's one of the premier military colleges, if you will, in our in our country. Tarsus was one of those type places. Okay? And so for lack of a better way of explaining this, Paul was raised in an environment that was very, you could even say militaristic, but it was very disciplined. Everything was about regiment. Everything was about exactness. Everything was even about law, as we're going to find out later on in his life. And so that was Paul. Paul was a product of his upbringing in the city. Now come back to uh, chapter 22, verse 3. Look what it says. Paul said, I am verily a man which am a Jew born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia. But look at this. Yet brought up in this city, that is Jerusalem at the feet of Gamaliel and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers and was zealous toward God as ye all are this day. Now when he's talking about the law and the fathers and all this stuff, that is all very much Israelite talk. That's Jewish talk. When he says he's talking about Abraham, Isaac, he's talking about Moses, he's talking about Jacob and the law of Moses. He's talking about the Old Testament law. And when he was raised under Gamaliel's teaching, it was as a law person, like a lawyer, like you guys would think, but except the law that he really honed in on and keyed in on was the law of Moses. Really important. Now here's the thing. Gamaliel was on his top, the top of his game. He was like a Harvard professor of law. Okay? And typically here's what happens. Students grow up under a certain type of instruction and under a certain type of instructor. And guess what tends to happen as they get out from under that instruction? They adopt the ways. They adopt the knowledge. And they implement that in their life. This is why y'all see so much debate in our modern time about the colleges and the universities and even in our elementary schools and middle schools and high schools and the curriculums they're using because everybody understands this. If you raise a child a certain way, guess what? More than likely, they're going to carry those ways with them. And so it's very important. Paul or Saul at this point was no different, raised, being raised and learning under Gamaliel as this lawyer. Um, and so, as is usually the case, uh, he, you know, he sort of followed in Gamaliel's ways. Now, I want you to go back with me to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. Y'all see how we're starting to build information about this character, Paul, that wrote the book of Ephesians. Trust me, it's going to be very important for us as we get into the book. Okay. Now, we know one thing about Saul. He was trained under Gamaliel. Now, we need to know a little something about Gamaliel because, again, it's going to help us understand more fully who this Paul character is. And if you come back to Acts chapter 5, come with me all the way down to verse 29. But before we get there, let me give you the context of what's happening in Acts chapter 5. Okay? So y'all can kind of look up and just listen for a minute. Back at the beginning of the book of Acts, remember... We have Jesus ascending into heaven. Okay? 
And he told the apostles, y'all hang out and, and pray until the Holy Spirit comes. The day of Pentecost comes, the Holy Spirit comes down in power, and then the apostles, they begin to preach and teach in all the languages of the Jews that had gathered there in Jerusalem for Pentecost. They were there for that celebration. Gamaliel was even there. Okay, You had Jews from all over the place that were there. All right, They had huge success. So much to the point they were causing a big stir in the city of Jerusalem. To the point it started making a lot of the officials, both Jewish and Roman, very nervous. Because in Roman culture back then, everything was about maintaining peace. And the way you maintain peace is you squelched any opposition. Okay? It was very totalitarian in that sense. And these Jewish higher-ups, they kind of had... A a weird relationship with the Roman rulers of the day, Pilate being one of those, where they basically had this deal, we'll keep our religious crowd quiet as long as you kind of just let us have our way. And that's really what it was. It was just sort of an appeasement there. And so, um, so there was a lot of conversions happening and a lot of healings and miracles and things going on, and there was this big uprising. Well, this group of Jews known as the Sadducees, who did not believe in resurrection... They didn't believe in angels, they didn't believe in miracles and all this spiritual stuff. They were sort of the rationalist of the day. Um, they were not happy because, again, Peter and the other apostles, they're stirring up the city and they're messing up their opportunities to, to be at peace and to practice their religion. And so they get imprisoned. Peter and his friends, they get imprisoned and then they're released by God. Then they're brought on trial, and then that's where we pick up the story here in Acts chapter 5. Now look what happens. Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, they're here on trial, uh, we ought to obey God rather than men. You guys are trying to tell us to be quiet, but we need to be obedient to God. And he goes on. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with His right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Now think about this. He's saying this to Sadducees. These guys have a lot of ruling power right now, but they don't believe in resurrection. So this is not making them happy. But you also have another group of rulers there known as the Pharisees, and they do believe in resurrection. And they're trying to gain power over the Sadducees. There's a weird dynamic going on there. Now, verse 32. And Peter says, And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law. This is the same Gamaliel that Saul was raised up under, that, was ta that taught Saul. A doctor of the law had in reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space and said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose up Theudas, uh, boasting himself to be somebody to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who was slain, and all, as many as obeyed him, were scattered and brought to nothing." After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing and drew away much people after him. He also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone, for if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest haply uh, ye be found even to fight against God. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, doesn't sound like they agreed too much. <laughs> we agree! Let's whoop your tail, okay? Um, and after they had beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Okay, so here's this guy, Gamaliel. He is, to put just a simple label here, he is a lawyer's lawyer. I mean, this guy knows the law. He's a rationalist. He, he is very much what we consider to be a legalist. He wants everything by the letter of the law, but he's also got some good judgment about him here. And this is the guy that teaches Saul. And the thing you've got to understand about these Pharisees, they get a bad rap a lot of times in the Bible. Remember, though, and we're going to see this here in a minute, Paul himself was a Pharisee. Now, Pharisaism, where it rose up, is back in the Old Testament times. If y'all remember, 
Israel sinned and God exiled them at the hands of the Babylonians. Right? So they went captive to Babylon. All right? They were there for 70 years and then by Cyrus, king of Persia, they were released and allowed to go back to their homeland, to their own religion and all this stuff. Right? It's in that period after their exile in Babylon that you had a lot of Jews standing up and in their own families and countries saying, Listen, guys, the last time we got carried away from our land because we disobeyed the law. So we need to make sure we obey God's law so that we don't get on the wrong side of Him again and be destroyed. And so you had a group of zealous Jews that rose up that began to really push adherence and obedience to the law of Moses. That's noble, right? That's a good thing. The problem is, over time, they sort of disconnected from the heart of the law, which was not just about obedience to the law, but love and respect for God Almighty. And so what began to happen, they began to push religious right to the point they sort of even started to rewrite the law and push it to such an extent that it became as authoritative or more authoritative than the actual Word of God. And so it kind of went south. Now this is the guy that Saul was raised under. Now, y'all turn with me to Acts 23. Y'all are thinking, this is the most boring, dull, and dry information I've ever heard in my life. And is this how the whole study of Ephesians is going to go? Hey, Renee, I thought you were going to fight with me today. What's up? Tired. All right. <laughs> Acts chapter 23. <laughs> Acts chapter 23. Look with me what happened. Not only was Saul taught by an extreme Pharisee. He was the son of one. Look with me at Acts chapter 23, verse 6. But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees, this is again when he was on trial, and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am what? A Pharisee. The son of a Pharisee. Of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. So Paul himself was a Pharisee. Now, let's put all this together just a little bit, and we're going to take a break, and y'all going to get some coffee. You're going to do some jumping jacks, and then when we come back from the break, we're going, to, we're going to start to get into a little more fun stuff, okay? But Saul is a Pharisee. He is a Jew, okay? Um, he is trained under Gamaliel from a military town, but he's brought up in Jerusalem. He's, he's you know, he, he comes into this world with a lot of discipline around him and he learns that. He learns the law. He's raised in sort of the religious center of the world at that time. He's disciplined. He's well trained. He's astute. He has a good pedigree because not only is he Jewish, but he also has Roman citizenship and that buys him a lot of time. You're right here in Acts, uh, Acts 23. Go back to chapter 22 real quick in verse 25. Acts 22 verse 25 and as they bound him with thongs, this is, uh, they're talking about Paul. Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? They had a law back then. You couldn't. If you're a Roman citizen, that, that gave you some protections there. So one of the things we find out, he's got this great pedigree because not only is he a Jew, but he has Roman citizenship. That's huge. And so by the world's terms, by the world's standards, this guy Saul of Tarsus in the region of Cilicia, even the religious world saw this guy as to be someone who was respected, revered, and on top of his game. Okay? With that being said, let's close with this for this little session, and then we're going to take a break. Go with me to Philippians chapter 3. I promise you all this is going to be very important here in a minute. <laughs> it may not seem like you just got to hang with me. Philippians chapter 3, and look what the Apostle Paul says of himself. Philippians chapter 3, verse 4. Paul says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he uh, have whereof he might trust in the flesh, he said, I have even more reason. Why is that? Verse 5. He says, I was circumcised the eighth day. That was according to the Jewish law of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. That's the priestly one. I mean, that's the, uh, the kingly tribe there. A Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, what? A Pharisee. You can't get any higher in the law. Um, this guy, he, he was a big dog. Concerning zeal, he, went, he pushed it to the point of persecuting the church because he thought 
That's what he needed to do to preserve obedience to the law. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, he said, I was what? Blameless. You couldn't bring a case against this guy. Okay? So Paul himself says, man, listen, Pharisee among Pharisees, big deal. But as was the case with Pharisees, the problem that always happens is they really couldn't see the forest for the trees. They were so enamored with the law, they couldn't really see the reason for it. They couldn't see the bigger picture. Now, when we come back from the break, we're going to take a little bit of a break. When we come back, we're going to look at that real quick because I think it's really important for us to understand this issue of Paul being a Pharisee and his, his zeal and all this stuff. So y'all take a break and it will come back.